It's Monday, October 19th, and this is now on H&N. We're only four days into this thing. Hawaii sees a steady number of arrivals on the first weekend of the traveler testing program. And it's coinciding with a worrying increase in hospitalizations. New coronavirus cases are the highest they've been since the summer. I'm Laura Podesta in New York, where a potential super spreader event is raising eyebrows. I don't want anyone else to go through this. An Eva Beach man recovering from COVID-19 has a warning for others. Millions of Americans are working from home because of the pandemic. I'm Michelle Medina with the growing trend of building backyard offices. These stories, plus we'll chat with the stars of Tyler Perry's Sistas coming up on This Is Now. Good afternoon. Thank you for watching This Is Now. We want to begin with breaking news. There's no impact to Hawaii, but the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center says parts of Alaska are under a tsunami warning after a 7.4 magnitude earthquake hit near Sand Point. The quake happened about 11 a.m. The warning is in effect for South Alaska and the Alaska Peninsula. Again, no warning for the state. We are going to monitor that very closely. Also, coming up in just a bit, we're expecting a live press conference from Kirk Caldwell. But first, your latest coronavirus numbers. Health officials are reporting 39 new COVID-19 cases today, but the breakdown is a little confusing. We're told 31 of the cases are on Oahu, seven are on the Big Island, two residents were diagnosed out of state, and one case has been removed from Kauai's count, which is how you get 39. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green is speaking out about how the state's pre-travel testing program is going so far. Here's what he had to say. It will be a reflection of how well we do while we care for people, when we're providing services at the hotels, uh, as we take care of people in restaurants, and as uh, tourism returns. The Safe Travels opening has been successful so far. We've tested almost everybody. Anyone who didn't get a test went into quarantine. We're bumping uh, through some cases, of course, bumpy roads on occasion during the day. But we have tested people. They don't have COVID. Then we did a follow-up test on the Big Island for everybody. Uh, Dr. Miskovich's team with Premier did that for uh, Mayor Kim. Mm. Of the first 2,800 people, uh, initially there were nine tests that came back positive. Five of them already have been false positives because of the antigen test rate. So maybe four out of 2,800 were positive, and we expect those to very likely be false positives too. So we're seeing numbers far lower than even our base rate here in our community among our local residents. So that should not be the impactful number. But to check that, as you know, we're gonna do things like the surveillance testing program and other tests just to be super safe. We also asked the LG, what kind of strain the new testing program puts on our contract tracers? For that crowd, for the cohort of travelers, it will put zero strain. First of all, they just, if they didn't have a test three days before, they're still asymptomatic and they're not positive. Okay. They're just in quarantine because they didn't follow the rules. Now, the curtain, uh, state of the contact tracing program is so much better than it was. At one point, you know, we were we stunk. We were at like 16 to 20 contact tracers. As of Friday, I believe we had 328 contact tracers and epidemiology team members going at this thing. 200 additional people on the bench. We had meetings throughout the weekend to discuss adding additional people, which we're going to add extra people because of travel and extra people to go and sort through these tests to make sure that the right people are in quarantine. So. We're really beefing up the, the team all the way through the end of the year so that, number one, safe travels works. Two, that if there is any surge whatsoever, we don't have to shut down again, if at all possible. All right, we want to take you live now to Mayor Caldwell, who is getting ready for a press conference right now to update us on new facilities being made available for those who need to quarantine throughout the city. Here we go. And while I don't see it, I know you guys are washing your hands more often. And as a result, as a result, today we had 31 cases on Oahu. 31 cases on Oahu. Probably the lowest ever from when we started reopening again. And we keep doing this, folks. If we keep doing this, we move into Tier 2. 
on Thursday. Tier two on Thursday. So keep doing it. In fact, we're drafting the order as we speak to send over to Governor Ige today. And we'd like to, if we can get it over to him, we'd like to share the draft version if he says it's okay. So those who are affected by tier two, like gyms, like other personal service care folks, restaurants now open up to non-family units can start to make the adjustments ahead of time so they're ready on Thursday. But we got to stay vigilant. We must stay vigilant because we could move into tier two and if we let our guard down, because the virus is not going to let its guard down, we could end up moving back into tier one if the cases go above 100 and a positivity rate of higher than 5%. Two week, for the next two weeks after we move into tier two. So guys, fingers crossed, but our fate is determined by us and what we do. And you guys have been doing a great job. Let's get it down and keep it down below 30 and a positivity rate below five. So we can move into the next tier after that. Now we're here today, not so much to announce that we're gonna move into tier two unless some extraordinarily bad things happen in the next couple of days. But to talk about the other thing that is so, so different as we open up again. And that are three things, and I think everyone could probably recite them, but it's about testing, more testing, capacity to test. It's about contact tracing, more contact tracing and capacity to contact trace. And the last one, is about quarantine and isolation, having sufficient number of rooms available to quarantine and isolate when necessary. Not after we see an increase in cases, but before we see an increase in cases. And today we're focusing on that, on the quarantine isolation component. And Eddie Mesro, who's behind me, straight behind me, from Department of Health, in, in a way is a hero in my mind. Uh, I wish he was more visible and up front back in March, but he is now, and I believe he's making a tremendous difference in terms of working on quarantine and isolation with the city and county of Honolulu and the Department of Health. And what we're here today to announce is increasing our capacity to quarantine and isolate on the island of Oahu. We're here to announce today that we've reached an agreement with Highgate, which manages and owns the park shore right over here behind this variegated banyan tree, the Park Shore. One of the most, I think, awesome hotels in Waikiki, because you stay in that hotel, you get views of Diamond Head, unobstructed. You get views of the ocean, unobstructed, and you can look down the coast, unobstructed. You couldn't find a better hotel to be quarantined or isolated in than the Park Shore. So that's one, we are announcing that hotel is available for quarantine and isolation, should it be needed. And then the Waikiki Beach side, which is right over here on Lemon Road, this little tiny lane, is a second um, opportunity for people to isolate and quarantine. And I wanna get into a little bit more detail on that. But with the bringing on of these two properties, we'll have a total of 452 rooms available for quarantine and isolation on Oahu, managed and operated by the Department of Health. We couldn't do it without them. We're using our CARES money to provide this infrastructure, these rooms. And then they bring their expertise and their care and love and compassion um, to support those who have to get isolated. So Park Shore, as I talked about, there's a total of 221 rooms in the Park Shore. And we have an opportunity to use these rooms in tranches of 80 rooms, 150 rooms, or all 221 rooms, we don't have any of them right now. They're ready to go with five days notice, five business days of notice. Now there is a cost to reser reserving rooms and having that availability, but we don't actually pay for the rooms until they're needed. So we don't wanna spend CARES money that we don't need to spend, but we need to be ready. It's our insurance policy. There's Mayor Caldwell right there talking live to us to the media, giving us update on additional 
facilities that will be used for quarantine and isolation. We want to move on to some other news now. Again, the state reported 39 new coronavirus cases today, but globally there are now 40 million coronavirus cases. In the U.S., the new cases are the highest they've been since the summer, and hospitalizations are up in at least 30 states. Here's Laura Podesta. The ICU at the University of Utah Hospital reached beyond full capacity, forcing patients into surge beds. Long term, this is a very difficult thing for our staff to be able to maintain. Nationwide, the number of daily new coronavirus cases has reached its highest level since the summer. In Chicago, as restaurants set up outdoor plastic bubbles for diners, city officials sounded the alarm on a second wave. As we head into the fall and winter months, it is the worst possible time to let our guard down. Cases in Chicago have risen by more than 50% over the last two weeks to more than 500 per day. And it's coinciding with a worrying increase in hospitalizations. In Brooklyn, New York, a planned wedding was expected to draw thousands of guests until officials concerned about a super spreader event stepped in. Representatives now say the Monday night wedding of a prominent member in the Hasidic community will only be open to close family members. I am heartened by the fact that the message was heard that it's not business as usual. And while researchers continue working on a vaccine, a new poll shows the percentage of Americans who say they'll likely get it as soon as it's available has dropped more than 10 points since August. Laura Podesta, CBS News, New York. The pandemic means jobs at the drugstore. Howard Dykus reports. CVS, parent of Long's Drugs, wants to immediately hire 15,000 employees nationwide. The company says it's to prepare for an expected winter rise in COVID cases and the flu, creating more demand for medications and tests. CVS and Long's are among state-approved COVID testers. When will Hawaii get cruises again? The short answer is no time soon. No cruises are scheduled for the remainder of the year. State officials indicate they'll talk to cruise lines, but only after they get CDC approval to sail. State officials say they met a Friday deadline to send the feds a state plan for how they're going to give people COVID vaccines once they have some. The plan has not been made public, but may be revealed this week. Today, we're learning more about Governor Ige's 27-member COVID-19 advisory panel. Civil Beat reports the group meets behind closed doors and doesn't make any decisions. Instead, it makes recommendations to the governor on certain issues. Members include Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, Health Director Libby Char, and former Health Director Virginia Pressler. The panel also features community leaders, including HMSA President and CEO Dr. Mark Mugiishi, along with Bank of Hawaii CEO Peter Ho and others. The group has had three meetings so far to discuss topics like reopening Hawaii to visitors. An Eva Beach man is on the road to recovery. He was hospitalized for a month and a half while battling COVID-19. Our Jelani Martinez spoke to the survivor about his experience with the virus. 42-year-old Eddie Biscara spent 48 days in the hospital. He says he didn't have any underlying health conditions, but during his battle with COVID, he went through a few complications and almost gave up. I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't want anyone else to go through this. 48 days, no family. With my 14-month-old daughter, luckily there's FaceTime. It's the only way I could see them. Eddie Biscara, along with his daughter and girlfriend, tested positive for COVID. It started with a shortness of breath and coughing in late August. While they quarantined and monitored their symptoms, Eddie's oxygen levels dipped to dangerous levels. <laughs> He was rushed to the Queen's Medical Center on punch bowl for intensive treatment. They had to put me on a ventilator, so, so they had to induce me on a 16-day coma. A few days after waking up from the coma, Biscaro got a blood clot in his lungs. His heart and kidneys started failing. Two doctors called my family on FaceTime. They said I won't make it overnight. So they asked my family to say goodbyes over FaceTime. I kept telling the doctors, you just have to do everything because I don't want to raise my daughter without a father. It was a tough night for his family, but Biscara made it through and started showing improvements. He calls it a miracle. A few hours later, somehow miraculously, I came back. I think I was 
fighting for my daughter. And my girlfriend. Now the COVID survivor hopes others will take the virus seriously and do their part in controlling it. I want to tell everybody that this thing is for real. I know a lot of people still think it's a joke. But yeah, we need everybody's help to pull together. Mascara was released from the hospital just this week. He's taking his road to recovery day by day. He's currently working on walking. He went from only being able to take two steps with a walker to now taking 84. Jelani Martinez, Hawaii News Now. And we would wish him the best there. Mm -hmm. You guys, did you get wet out there this morning? Let's see the check of the weather and see if there's any more rain on the way. Here is Guy Hockey. How's it on this Monday? We're watching this weak cold front as it pulls away. It's going to linger, though, over Kauai and Oahu through tomorrow. And that means we are expecting more spotty showers, maybe some heavy downpours for Kauai and Oahu that could lead to flooding. Uh, fewer showers expected for the east end of the state. And we'll all have light corner winds today. Of course, that will lead to higher than normal humidity levels. And those corner winds will linger through tomorrow as well. So today's going to be a repeat of yesterday as that cold front lingers. Clouds and showers mainly for Kauai and Oahu. Maybe even some isolated downpours. And those south corner winds means these temperatures will feel even warmer with the high humidity levels. Now, as far as the surface on the way down with the best conditions up in the country because of those southerly winds, no significant swells expected anytime soon except for on Sunday. Look for the swells to start picking up out in the country. So again, uh, semi-soggy conditions, cloudy skies for Kauai and Oahu through tomorrow. And then on Wednesday, drier conditions as that front starts to pull away, leaving behind just a few wind and mouth showers. And those light winds going to continue into the early part of next week. Keep it here on Hawaii News Now. We'll have all your severe weather updates. Tyler Perry Sisters is back with an exciting and much anticipated season two. The hit series follows a group of single African-American females as they navigate their complicated love lives, careers, and friendships. I got a chance to talk to two of the show's stars this morning, Novi Brown and Mignon. So season two was filmed in what's known as a production bubble amid the pandemic, much like many sports teams are doing. Tell me, what was that experience like? It's a stressful summer camp. It was fun. It was, I mean, I guess summer camp, you can't leave the premises because you're a kid, but you know, it was, it was intense, but it was so much fun. Like he had food trucks for us. He had a bar truck for us. Like it was incredible. But at the same time, like we're walking around with these masks on in Georgia heat. It was just this paradoxical experience. It was great. It was great. It was definitely like camp. I grew up like camp. Um, but I think that's a good way to think about it, man. Y'all, you can't leave as a kid. So as a we live this prize, you know what I'm saying? And we got paid to be there. So and we, you know, and we're making what we want to make. We're doing what we want to do. And it's it's changing the dialogue of entertainment with this yeah. new world. Well, since the show does focus on the single life, tell me how's that changed in 2020 with all this worry about coronavirus? Well, I, I don't, I honestly, I don't know. It's different. Yeah. I mean, I've been kind of single my whole life, but I mean, it's, it still feels different though, because as you get older and as you go through different experiences, there's just something that hopefully you're taking with you and that you're learning. And I think in 2020, being single, it's really teaching you that you it's all about perspective and how you frame it. Because if you're single in the middle of a pandemic, you got to sit with yourself and you got to learn to love yourself and enjoy your own company. So if you hadn't done that up until now, I really hope you took advantage of this time. And that show airs Wednesdays on BET. Let's see what else the internet's talking about. You know, a letter. We've been talking about a lot about these auctions. Mm -hmm. And this one has a little surprise in it. There's a letter out there. This is from the original Beatles manager. Did you know in 1960 there was a different drummer for the Beatles? I did Pete not. Pete Best was his name. He was alongside Lennon, McCartney, and Harrison. Uh, that was before they hit international fame. Well, Brian Epstein signed the band in 1962, and he soon dismissed Pete Best. 
And so this is that letter right there describing just that. It was dated September 1962. In it, he expressed sincere best wishes for that drummer's success, but ouch. Yeah. Like, <laughs> man, missing out on those royalty checks. Uh, but their only estimate, estimate for this letter is, guess what, how much? Any guesses? Um, maybe a couple thousand. 1300 oh, bucks. Okay. Yeah, I think. They say it could go higher. I definitely think it will. There's so many Beatles fans out there. That poor drummer. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, this was really funny if you saw it on TV, you guys. So John Oliver's rant about a small Connecticut town earned him his name on the city's sewer plant. And the late night host was there for the dedication. Now, Danbury Mayor Mark Bowton posted a picture with Oliver to commemorate the moment. But Bowton originally suggested the name change to show his anger towards Oliver. So this is what happened on August 16th, the host of HBO's Last Week Tonight did a segment on racial disparities on juries. Now, during this segment, Oliver flew into a rant aimed at the city of Danbury, and that's when Bolton suggested naming their sewer plant after Oliver. So Oliver took the offer and ran with it, saying he would donate $55,000 to local charities in Danbury if the mayor agreed to name the sewer plant after him. Well, Bolton agreed, and the TV host held up his end of the offer. So hilarious. That's, I love it. That's my favorite of the late night. So I guess it's not necessarily late night because mm -hmm. I always watch it streaming. But right, right. You and you guys, Adele, she's hosting Saturday Night Live this weekend for the first time. The 15 time Grammy winner reacted on Instagram saying, quote, I'm so excited about this and also absolutely terrified. Remember, she has really bad stage fright. So she noted her first time on the show as a musical guest was nearly 12 years to the wow. day. And the British singer songwriter credits the appearance with launching her career in the U.S. Now, she returned as a musical guest again five years ago, and the news of her hosting has some people speculating that maybe she's ready to release a new album. It's been a while. Yeah, and I can't believe she's been around that long. She really is part of one of my all-time favorite funniest skits. With That was on the Ellen Show. Oh, oh so good. She, you, was it Jamba Juice? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so funny. So funny. <laughs> she's, she's a good sport. And this is interesting, you guys. So the pandemic has forced many people to work from home. Some have taken over their living rooms, their dining tables. Well, as Nichelle Medina reports, others are heading to the backyard. Miguel Blas is getting a new addition in his backyard. It's, it's been a long time coming. Miguel has been working from home since March because of the pandemic. I'm in here with, uh, you know, my entire family. We're three generations in here, um, so it can get kind of, uh, you know, rowdy. He needed more space. The solution, a backyard office. We've seen a, just a huge explosion in our orders. Boss Home CEO Vegan Ohanesian says his sales are up 35 percent. There's a growing demand nationwide with so many Americans working remotely. Companies that specialize in tiny homes and she sheds are now shifting to backyard offices. This combines a small space with the big feel. The homes vary in size and can be customized to include a kitchen and bathroom. The structure is shipped as a do-it-yourself kit complete with instructions and can be built in three days. So here it is. You have your tiny house with all the walls and windows. Miguel hired workers to build his and opted for a basic model, which is 160 square feet. The price tag, $13,000, an investment to better juggle work and family life. So the nice part is that when I'm here, you know, I'll be at work and they'll know that clear separation. And then when I'm at home, they'll know I'm available for them to, you know, assist them on whatever they need. With the new office complete, Miguel looks forward to enjoying his new workspace and short commute across the yard. Nichelle Medina, CBS News, Los Angeles. Hey, that's going to do it for this Monday on This Is Now. Our web team is working hard right now, wrapping up that Kirk Caldwell press conference. They're posting all the details you need to know right now on our H&N digital platforms. Goodbye.